people are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? Book 1, Genesis, Chapter 4, A Death in the Family, Part 3. Ronald Reagan had attempted to pry open a commercial window into space after the 1986 Challenger space shuttle disaster. I even mentioned the President's effort in our generic business proposal. As a grassroots space program, we feel the commercial privatization of space is necessary if mankind is to survive beyond the next thousand years. The stars are our destiny, Mr. Insert Name here and the future belongs to those who understand this today. Our dream of developing orbital-grade launch vehicles seemed within reach after President Reagan ordered NASA to restrict its shuttle launches exclusively to scientific and military payloads after the 1986 Challenger disaster and leave the launching of commercial satellites to private enterprise. Seven years later, there is no commercial privatization of space in any real sense, as NASA has ignored Reagan's edict and still conducts business as usual with the same handful of giant aerospace contractors it has dealt with since the agency's inception. NASA has even successfully lobbied for legislation that effectively binds developmental capabilities of small aerospace companies with red tape. Our rocket designs are today limited in size, weight, and propellant burn times by the U.S. government. It's the fucking DOT, Tom grumbled. The Department of Transportation. They're in bed with NASA. The DOT today regulates private space launches. Funny thing is, there aren't any. I want to congratulate the government on that. They've managed to regulate an entire industry. That doesn't exist, I said, assisting Tom's tirade. He had interrupted himself by puffing frantically on a cigarette, choking himself with smoke. Doesn't even exist, Tom yelled suddenly and smokily. Congratulations, federal government. You've created a whole governing body with our tax dollars. Laws, rules, people. For something that doesn't exist. Tom emphasized his insight with a booming belt of personal idiosyncrasy as distinguished as Paul's Do you see what I'm saying retort? Ted's prophecies of doom? Or Lauren's biblical banter? I was jealous. I wanted to be peculiar too. Speaking of fucking Reagan, I said, thinking perhaps I could become the guy who always says fuck. Reagan challenged fucking NASA back in 84 to put up this fucking space station within 10 fucking years? Here it is 11 fucking years later, and they spent 11.4 billion fucking dollars on this fucking project, and they just cut loose 2.1 billion for next fucking year, for research and construction. I'm fucking thinking, what fucking construction? There's nothing in the fucking air. They're not building any fucking thing. It's all just a fucking banner for them to raise and get funding for fucking black projects and secret weapons. Fuck! It's a scam, Tom replied calmly. Team Milliron also seemed to have understood perfectly, nodding sympathetically after my outburst. I felt wonderful. I was home, in the midst of my people, surrounded by kindred souls. Tom then delivered the bottom line. Today's aerospace contractors only do studies and reports. They'll do a bunch of meetings and then do some more reports. The only thing getting flown is the 2,000-page report they fax to Washington. Then they'll say, look, we delivered. That's what they today call results. It sounded all too familiar. The toilet business down at Acorn was fraught with useless meetings that only produced murderous migraines and boiling bowels. But in all fairness, I must admit, we didn't accomplish much rocket business this evening. Ron's death had cast a pall of gloom over proceedings that saw us mostly get hopelessly stoned. We did unanimously vote to have Al Singh paint in memory of Ron Milfeld on the side of the Genesis 2, our liquid fuel rocket I had just featured in a sales brochure. The Genesis 2 was waiting liftoff and secured beneath a tarpaulin in Ronnie's backyard, the rocket we hoped to fly once my business proposals had convinced one, or more, investors to investigate the vast riches that lay overhead. It was also decreed a trash recycling program be initiated to raise the capital for the nitric acid that would fuel the Genesis 2, a determination I immediately seized upon, as IRS marketing director, to exploit in future advertising, turning garbage into starships. Paul had put the arm on the IRS team and local rocket community, raising $1,200 to present the widow Joyce. Finally, Paul McEwen announced he would deliver a eulogy at Ron's funeral service. In a quiet moment with Paul, I offered my help. Have you thought about what you're going to say? I asked. 
Nah, I just said he was my best friend for 17 years. Paul was losing composure again, pushing tears onto his temples with open palms. Because I could help you write it? No, Chuck, you're doing enough writing. I have to do this one by myself. And he did it alone. Four days later, Paul stood in a memorial chapel before a hundred souls and spoke of his friend Ron Milfeld, his voice never betraying his pain. It was a requiem for a rocket man, and it was then that I knew. If Paul could pull this off, he could do anything. The son of a bitch had me crying. Afterwards, at the cemetery, a boombox wailed with the strains of Elton John's Rocket Man. A minister droned David's 23rd Psalm, and finally a small model rocket was launched, prefaced with a boisterous countdown by the mourners. I wondered about the appropriateness of doing a countdown. The launch itself seemed germane. Gun salutes are common at funerals, so why not a single rocket volley for our fallen comrade? There's nothing disrespectful about doing a countdown, Paul told me. It has to do with the state fire marshal regulations. It's not a legal firing without one. Oh, okay then. Fine business. We certainly wouldn't want to do anything illegal. We are about to witness the takeoff of the first manned rocket to outer space. We pick up the count. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero! We're off to visit the planet. There are treats galore in the sky. Venus is loaded with candy. And ice cream is found upon Mars. The soda pop is an unpattern. When you're thirsty, it's sure it's a spot. And Jupiter's really jumping. With pop on this butter and pop. But the best of them all is the planet. Where all of these treats are at hand. And that is the spot we now head for. A theater refreshment stand. Book 1, Genesis, Chapter 5, The Fourth Estate, Part 1 I don't remember who came up with the idea. Most likely it was Ted, who told it to Paul, who came up with the name. The Freeman Foundation, Paul had said, because we want to be free men. Our strategy was to create a non-profit organization that would generate national interest in space and exercise the promise in Genesis. Nothing will be restrained from them which they imagine to do. Once we had everyone's thinking aligned, the stars would be the limit, and our destination. To rekindle the trailblazing spirit of the Apollo era, we would establish a charitable organization to solicit private and public donations, to build rockets, to fly away. At least that's what we would tell our disciples. The Freeman Foundation would also have a dark underbelly beneath its altruistic exterior. Do you know how many millions we can save with a tax-exempt status? Paul asked breaking dried marijuana buds into pipe bowl sized pieces on my coffee table. It was a Wednesday night, time for another general business meeting of IRS. My telephone was committed to the cause, with the answering machine greeting religiously wed to a midweek gathering of rocket men. Thank you for calling Independent Rocket Systems. Unfortunately, no one is in the office to take your call, so please leave a message at the tone and we will contact you as soon as possible. If you are calling to obtain meeting information, the next scheduled headquarters meeting is slated for Wednesday at 8 p.m. Tom Chapel was reclining in a rattan rocking chair, his feet in a paroxysm of anxious rhythm threatening to undo femininely crossed legs. Ted Stevens sat quietly sipping beer, running rocket calcs on the T.I. Lauren Miller had staked out most of the sofa, and Paul was speaking of laundering huge sums of money. We'll establish this rocket charity, see? For people interested in space? And we'll go around soliciting donations and conducting seminars like these people do. Paul waved a program flyer for an upcoming Whole Life Expo, a kind of new age convention to be held at the Los Angeles Airport Hyatt Hotel six weeks hence. I examined the flyer and noticed one of the featured speakers would be Michael Lindemann. Hey Ted, I yelled, your new world order guy is appearing at this thing. Death to the Olympians, Ted replied, not even bothering to turn away from the monitor. People who attend something like this are already into things like space, Paul said, stabbing at the flyer with a spastic finger. They're into alternative thinking. This is the UFO crowd. There are women at these seminars who will worship your cock and fuck your brains out if you tell them you're from a moon of Uranus. I glanced at Tom, thinking I might detect some unease at Paul's animated pronunciation. Uranus! But Tom now sat calmly in the rocker, manipulating a pair of golf balls with his left hand, an out-of-uniform Captain Queeg. Suddenly Tom tossed the top flights back into the wicker fruit basket atop the coffee table and leapt to his feet. We're going to put together a coalition of crackpots, he asked. The expo roster of featured speakers did seem like it would lure some queer fish from outside the mainstream. It was obvious that seekers of every stripe would soon be converging on the Hyatt Hotel, not just the UFO crowd. 
The flyer promised lectures and seminars on techniques for achieving nirvana, from yoga to transcendental meditation to hypnosis to holistic medicine. Welcome to Cult City. Yes, Paul admitted, they're crackpots, but they're crackpots with money. And if they've got disposable income to piss away, they might as well give it to us. All we gotta do is download our information on them. Do you see what I'm saying? Our doomsday scenario. The absolute necessity to become a multi-planet species. These people will eat our shit up. Paul had a wicked look in his eye and a chortle in his vocal timber. We'll stage our own lectures at seminars, charge for workshop classes, sell videotapes and literature. Literature? A synaptic bomb detonated in my head. You mean like a newspaper? In the Brazance, I saw the nameplate of the first issue. Old English typeface a la the New York Times and truth spelled with a capital onk, the ancient symbol of eternal life and a bastardized hint of the emblem of Christianity, just to confuse the Jesus freaks. An impression of an ancient South American cave drawing depicting space-suited combatants for our cognoscenti of misfits. A sort of yin-yang balance of cracked pottery, 